will pray in the spirit and the understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. Will all you that mourn in Zion? I have authority to appoint unto you in Zion the oil that will set you free. Yeah, come on. Put on the garment. For the spirit of heaviness, lift up your voice to God. We pray in the spirit and the understanding. Oh, magnify the Lord. Lift up your hands that hang down. Lift up your voice now still. And give unto God in Zion. Something about make you still well Spirit of heaviness Lift up your voice to God We'll pray in the spirit And the understanding Oh, magnify the Lord Yeah, we're going to end right there There's a couple more verses to that one But uh, the distance in my little chords are not uh, picking it up as much as I like. I know this one though. I think you do too. I found a new way of living. I found a new, new life divine. I have the fruit of the Spirit. I'm abiding, abiding in the vine. Abiding in the vine, abiding in the vine. Love, joy, health, he, he has made them mine. Oh, I have prosperity, power, and victory. Abiding, abiding in the vine. Yeah, one more time. Well, I found a new way of living. I found a new life divine. I have the fruit of the Spirit. I'm abiding, abiding in the vine. And where we're going? Abiding in the vine, abiding in the vine. Love, joy, help, he, he has made them mine. Oh, I have prosperity, power, and victory. Abiding, abiding in the vine. Let's just lift our hands to heaven tonight. Father, we thank you today for the power of your word. Hallelujah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Father. We're not just abiding out there in Hope Land. Father, we've got a strong word, Father, from you. And we're blessed. We cannot be cursed. Father, we thank you today. Because why? Oh, he is Lord. He is Lord. And he has risen from the dead, and he is Lord. Every knee shall. personal for your my lord your my lord and you have risen from the dead and you're my lord and my knee does bow and my knee does Lord. We'll praise you in the spirit, Lord. Oh, 
you are God and we magnify your name. Lord, you're good. You're so good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Father, we just hold up our youth and our adults that are in Honduras right now. Father, we thank you today. Safety and travel, we thank you for their, they got there and say, Lord, and I thank you they'll have a beautiful time. Yes. Uh, that there'll be adult and youth will be encouraged and a life-changing experience for them. Uh, Father, to, to see uh, the work of uh, Guy Henry and his, his whole crew there. Father, we thank you today, uh, Lord, that uh, they're blessed and their many will come to know the Lord through the young people, through their different programs that they have, preaching of the word to the students. Lord, and we just thank you today for all these things in Jesus' name and many more trips, many yeah. more things to yeah. do. Can you say amen? Amen. And I'm pounding on the table, and your mic is probably bouncing, isn't it? Let's give Hiram a good hand clap. Amen. Is that on? Am I on? Yeah, yeah you're on. Okay. Are you? Yeah. All right. Amen. It's nice to be here. Nice to see a different crowd a little bit. And this looks real nice to talk to you today. I just want to uh, uh, just share with you a little bit what's going on in my life. And up? Oh. No, you, yeah, it didn't come on. It didn't? No. Okay. This is new to me here. Yeah. On. Nope. Nope. I don't see it on, at least. Okay, I'll yeah, do it this way. You're on. you're on. Okay. They went off? Yeah, you're on. I'm on? Okay. All right, this is a new little gadget. There's usually another one with a piece of tape on that I can feel my way around. All right, so anyway, just want to talk to you a little bit about God's Word. I'm going to be talking about establishment tonight. Uh, I think it's important in our life that we are established. I know at the age of 50, I'm 60 now, I, I asked myself this question, and I said, why am I born again? And I wrote out, uh, I got a yellow pay, a yellow notebook and I wrote out all these reasons why I was born again and by the time I was done I was this big spiritual hulk Arr, you know God. you know and then something told me in my heart go to the Bible and see why you're born again so I did and there's only like three references uh, in the Bible in the New Testament where it talks about being born again three times so I went to those references I went to uh Nicodemus. Oh, not, I went to the John chapter 3 where Jesus has an, an encounter with Nicodemus and I found out that you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And then it said I must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Well, this big head just went down like this. Because I couldn't find no scripture that made me being born again this big spiritual hulk. And at the age of 50, it really messed me up. That scripture messed me up because I was always taught. I was brought up in church, so I was always taught about being born again, being born again, songs about being born again, being born again, doctrines about being born again, only to find out it's only mentioned three times in the Bible. And the main reason is to see the kingdom of God and to enter the kingdom of God. So I started reading the Bible a little bit different. I went back to Genesis and I started reading it because I was confused. I could only put three things down about being born again. I put like 20 things down, according to Hiram, according to what I was taught. Uh, and then the three things were, the, well, the two things were basically to enter and to see the kingdom of God. So we must be born again. We must be born again. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to, but it just encouraged me to really read the Word of God and be established. So the last 10 years of my life, now I'm 60, I go back to the Word of God. I was brought up in Sunday school from the age of probably three years old because my parents, I'm a PK, preacher's kid. And uh, 
So I've been in church all my life. I was presented, I think, in church at eight days. After a week that I was born, I was presented in church. So I've been in church for a long, long, long time. At the age of 15, I rebelliously left church with a bang. I went, and it's not something I'm proud of, but I went after the elders of the church physically. Uh, the detectives had to come, not the police, but detectives came to the high school, took me out. They wanted to know, why would you do this? Because they were confused. Why would somebody with no criminal record go after the elders of the church? And we, they took me in, and they did not arrest me. It was a confusing situation. They never had something like that happen to them. And I tried to explain. I ended up paying damages, and, and, and they, they let it go. They dropped it off my record and everything. And it was all based on the Bible, on the Bible that I, I really felt this, um, I guess, this deception as a kid at 8, 9, 10 years old, I was reading the Bible, I was having questions, why did God have to destroy everybody on earth in Noah's flood? You know, I was taught on flannels, uh, you know, Noah waving goodbye and in Sunday school at three years old, five years old, six years old, they would put the flannels up, they would put Noah's ark up, they would put all these little giraffes and animals, and then Noah real happily waving <laughs> bye to everybody. And God, is destroying humanity. I couldn't understand that at 10 years old. But then Father God destroys humanity and then all of a sudden his son loves the whole world. For God so gave, you know, for God so gave his only son. And so it brought a lot of confusion in my life at 10 years old. I was, I've always been a reader. One of the things I did was when I had questions, I would go to the library. And I would go to the librarian because we didn't have Google back then. We didn't have uh, a search engine. I would say, uh, lady, you know, the librarian, I said, I have this question about this. Okay? The sons of God. At 10, 11 years old, I wanted to know who the sons of God were. And, you know, in Pasadena, there's a big theology uh, university out there, a college. I don't know the name of it, but the Pasadena Library, I'm from Los Angeles, had a big reference room. And she, it would take her 30 minutes, and then she would bring me these big giant books and says, well, you know, here are the places that talk about the sons of God in Genesis 6. And I did this, and I did this, and I did this. So at the age of 16, I thought by what I was reading in these reference library books and then what people were teaching me, from the Pope, but I got, I rebelled. I was wrong, but I rebelled. But thank God I was taken to church, though. There's a lot of stuff that I learned, and, and I held on. I never left God. I rebelled against church. So at the age of 50, I asked myself that question. And now I've been traveling uh, a little bit more, because I used to travel. This is the longest time I've ever been in a city for 20 years, and it's because of Erica. She's helped me. You know, I don't know. I just find it comfortable. I've lived since an adult, every two years I lived in a new city, in America and around the world. I was a missionary. I've always been on the streets, trying to preach, trying to teach, start Bible studies. I started churches in Mexico. So I've been on the go for a long time. For the last 20 years, uh, we married and we settled down in, in Jackson. We had children, my second family. And, you know, God's a, a, a merciful God. And he gave me another opportunity to reestablish uh, myself as a father, as a husband, and, and uh, now as a grandfather. And I do have another family in Phoenix that I've been visiting, other children, grown children that I've been visiting lately. But I was, um, it's the longest I've been in the city, 20 years. So I'm starting to travel. I'm trying to tell you guys a, little, a lot about me in a real short time. But at that age of 50, when I asked myself that question, why must I be born again? And I found out I started really reading the Bible a lot differently, trying to really establish myself in the word of God, trying to take seriously when it says above all faith. I just don't look at it like, well, maybe faith, but above all faith, seek first. The kingdom of God. I take those words seriously now. You know, I really do. 
I, I, I go a lot to Genesis. When I get confused, I go back to Genesis. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's politics, if it's uh, the sexual revolution is going on again, no matter what it is, I go back to Genesis. And, and, and I, I, or listen to Joyce Meyer. She usually sets me straight. I don't like listening to her, but I'll listen to her for a couple of weeks just to get back on track. Or to Miles, uh, not Miles Monroe, I always say Miles Monroe, your favorite. Mike, uh, Mike Murdoch. You know, he has a big Spanish ministry and Erica uh, participates in that. And, and uh, uh, I li I'll sit and listen to him just to get back on track because it's real easy for me to want to get off track. So I think establishment in the times we're living, being established, and now that word established or establishment is a real popular word now, D.C. There's establishment. There's an establishment we found out four years ago that exists in D.C. that's really deep, very deep. There's a deep state and then there's a deep state within the deep state. You know, uh, Stephanopoulos just did, a, uh, uh, he just interviewed our POTUS, I'll say it that way because this goes on, on, on uh, it'll eventually go on YouTube. So he interviewed our POTUS, okay? And if you don't know what that is, look at it, look, look it up later. Uh, he interviewed our POTUS, and so I did some research on Stephanopoulos, because I know who he is. I know exactly who he is. And after reading his biography in 20 minutes, and, and I found in several different places, Way at the bottom it said, he is a member of the CFR, for you don't know of, if you don't know what the CFR is, Council Foreign Relations. That's the deep state within the deep state. That's global. And that's establishment, if you look at it from the point of view politically or in globalism or in a world point of view, that's the establishment of establishments, the Council Foreign Relations. But we as Christians, we're established. We are established, and we need to really, really, in the times we're living, I, I travel, I, was, I spent two days in Denver this time. What I thought was I was going to go uh, research the, some of the uh, re reservations in that area, and instead I work, woke up at 5.30 in the morning, and I started walking the streets just to see how many drug addicts are walking the streets at 5.30 in the morning, blown away. Have you ever been to Denver? There's something called the Union Station, beautiful piece of building, been there for many years, surrounded by beautiful, uh, a lot of restaurants. And at 5.30 in the morning, I could literally say hundreds of drug addicts were walking the streets. Hundreds. Some with skateboards, some laying on the floor, some inside the Union Station, policemen just trying to move them. They really treat them like uh, they're not doing nothing wrong. Needles, the whole bit. And I was like, I was taken back because, of course, we know we're in an op uh, opium epidemic here in, in, in Jackson. I had never seen anything like it before. I went to Phoenix, same thing. Drug addicts everywhere. Homeless people everywhere. I'm familiar with homeless people because I'm from Los Angeles. I go to Los Angeles, went to the Dodger game, and wow, we, the bus went by would seem a mile or two miles of just tents in downtown with people who work, executives walking, workers walking by, just, just, it was something. It's just like, wow, what America is this? You know, what, what, you know it, caught, it caught me off guard. I'm like, what America is this? Drug addicts everywhere. And I just do a little bit more research. I go to City Hall. Why, what, are, what are these people? And, of course, these cities consider themselves sanctuary cities. A lot of them are not just drug. They're, they're, they're hooked on methadone, I guess. And, and the city gives them methadone and they clean up. But we're living in times that are very different from we have been living for many, many, many years. Very different. Uh, my first trip, I, went in, I flew into Phoenix to see my children. And then I, I took the bus to Fontana, California, the Greyhound bus to go 
visit my parents. And, and the whole time, even the first trip and the second trip and the third trip, I really wanted to go work with, with, with the reservation, with the Native Americans. And I ended up at the bus station in Phoenix, the Greyhound bus station, and there was probably, without exaggeration, thousands of immigrants trying to catch a bus. Thousands. And these aren't just your, these, you could, they're little people, very brown, very dark. You know, they're natives from some, either Honduras or, or Guatemala uh, with children. And, you know, a lot of these groups just missed the bus. The, you know, I'm like, finally I said, what are you guys doing? They're somewhere outside. Of course, the, pe the news agencies were there, Fox and everybody. And, and, and I, I, there was this one group of people, probably about 20 of them. How long have you been here? Since yesterday. I said, let me look at your ticket. I got your bus left at 6.30 in the morning. You know? And they're like, well, we're just waiting. So I felt like investing and get them on their way out. You know? Because I know what it is to be stranded in the city. I'm still talking about establishment. I am going to talk a little bit about the Bible, quite a bit. And so I got them together, I go, and we found out they could get on the next bus, and I got them on that bus. On that bus. Did you have to speak to them in Spanish? Spanish, yeah. All in Spanish, because the bus stations blurted out. And they have no clue. They don't speak Spanish. The immigration department comes in every four hours to make sure that they ate, so they give them a voucher, and they could use the voucher at the Greyhound station. But they're just there. So my second time around, I went prepared, and I knew this was going to be the same scenario, same thing. And this time I started meeting them and talking to them, and, and I, especially the young ladies with children. And I got to know them, and I, I jumped on a bus with them and took them to where they were going. And these immigrants that are coming in are Christians, because what came out of their mouth is this. In this city, we had to rebuke the devil. In this city, we had to rebuke the devil. And I started, I was, so you're a Christian, yes. And we didn't like Mexico because of the virgin. I go, you know, I told him, you know, you're not going to make a lot of friends talking bad about the virgin, you know, the Virgin Mary. And, and, and I told him, because you're going to San Bernardino, you're going to L.A. I go, who did, you, you know, and I try to explain to him, you know, Jesus was born out of the Virgin Mary, so you got to love her. You know, and, and I go, look at it from that point of view. Don't be talking negative because you're going to make enemies. Your doors are going to close in America if you start talking about it. But anyways, uh, so I, I got a couple of these people in and uh, on the bus with the children. I got to know them. They're Christians. And this is, the, this is one of the scriptures. They, the ones that are coming in will tell you it's a miracle. We've been at the border for three weeks and they, the judge let us through. There's people who've been there for six months on asylum. And the scripture they grasp their whole journey on is wherever I set my foot, that's my land. That's a promise that was given to, to Moses, to Abraham. And that's what they, they based their journey on, wherever I set my foot. And I'm not going to tell you, I'm for the wall, okay? But I'm just telling you, I've been stranded all over. I've been stranded. And every time somebody has helped me out. And I'm going to tell you who mostly Mormons and Muslims. Mormons have taken me into their home for a couple of weeks. I was stranded in Phoenix in 1987. I was fresh out of the missionary as a missionary. I had been in, in Mexico for four years. And uh, it was time for me to leave and I didn't want to go back to LA. And I was in Phoenix, I was stranded, no money, no nothing. And I said, Lord, I'm, you know, I need your help now. I'm not gonna beg because I'm a righteous man. I'm not gonna stand on the corner, I'm a righteous man. I'm, I'm gonna stand on your word. The first time somebody helped me out was a, a, a black gentleman. He said, what are you doing? You know, I, I, I noticed you here yesterday, and you're still here. Today, I said, I'm sleeping at the bus station. That's before 911 when you could sleep at, you know, bus stations and stuff. And I said, I'm just trying to get my bearings, see what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go. He said, I'm going to Tucson. He says, I'm, I have a trailer, and I'm getting ready to move. I got 30 days left on that trailer. 
if you want to go, there's a lot of work in Tucson. So I bought me a bus ticket and here I go to Tucson. And I established myself. That gentleman was not a Mormon. He was a, a Brandonite. And you know Brother Brandon? Uh, you know what Brandonites are? You could look it up. He, Brother Brandon was a, a tremendous evangelist prophet. He brought in the, move, the movement of laying on of hands in the, in the late 40s. And, but out of that, he wrote a lot of books. The Brandonites... Uh, read more his books than the Bible, sort of like us, Word of Faith, might sometimes read more Kenneth Hagin than the Bible, you know. But, and they made a religion out of it, or, and I went to a couple of the services, and it was, you know, eh, but they took me in. You know, and from there I established myself, I, I, I started working, and so I know what it is, I have a heart for these people. Now, I've been going to visit my children, my parents, but with also to go to the Indian reservations has been switching around a little bit because they're coming in. We're supposed to go ye. And we haven't been going ye. So guess what's happening? They're coming ye. You know, in, in, in the book of Acts, in the books of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8, it says what? Go ye into all the earth, right? Be filled with the Holy Spirit and go ye into all the earth, to the uttermost parts of the earth, to Samaria, to Judea. And we didn't. They didn't. They stayed in Jerusalem because like 29 year, years later, I believe in Acts chapter 27, I'm not sure it says, and the church in Jerusalem was being persecuted greatly. They stayed. And a great persecution came to the church in Jerusalem. They were still there. They didn't listen to the Holy Spirit. They, they weren't going to Judea, Samaria, to the other, uttermost parts of the earth. And a great persecution came to the church in Jerusalem. And then it says, and they were scattered to Judea and Samaria. And sometimes I think what's happening in America is that we are supposed to go ye. We used to go ye. In the 50s, in the 40s, in the 30s, the, the uh, Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Christians, this, everybody used to go ye. We stopped going ye. Now they're coming ye. And I think that's because of that and, and, and all the turmoil America's going through is because of a disobedience of not, of not going ye. But that's a little bit about me, where I come from, and, and I believe in the times we're living because they're changing. If you're just in Jackson or not, really going around into the inner cities and to the bus stations and to the airports. I spent 24 hours traveling with a, with a mama and her daughter and, and, uh, and got, a, got them on the plane. They walk around with these little manila envelopes that says, my name is this, I'm an asylum, whatever, immigrant, and then I'm headed to the, and they, all they do is show this wherever they go. And I got these people on the airplane, and they made it. I'm communicating with them. They're, 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 the lady got a job, and they're established. And some of the horrific, they show me pictures of the things they've been through just traveling, you know, three weeks from uh, Guatemala all the way to the, to the border. Just a lot of stuff. 100% of these people were Christians. So I wasn't winning souls. They were already confessed Jesus Christ and Lord and Savior. They already were Christians. I was just helping them get on their way. So let's, let's talk a little bit about um, establishment, okay? We need to be established in these last days. I really believe it with all my heart, established. We have enough word in us to know about, we know about prosperity above all, we know about faith. We know that if we seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, all these things shall be added unto you. You don't have to worry about house payment. You don't have to worry about the water bill. You don't have to worry about the clothes on your back. You don't have to worry about having gas in your car. You don't have to worry about a car because we seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. But now that we know all these things, we need to go out there. We have a lot of people coming in from different countries, from all over the world. And we need to now start uh, going out and teaching these people. Maybe the things they don't know. You know, they don't know. But let's, let's talk about establishment a little bit. And in the Hebrew, uh, the word establishment is, this is from the King James Version Dictionary definition. It says establishment. Stabilo, sta, stabilio, I guess that's the, the Latin word. In Hebrew, it means to set 
fix established. To set and fix firmly or unalterably to settle permanently. I will establish, they use this as a reference, I will establish my covenant for an everlasting covenant. Genesis 17, 7. Okay? That's what they use. So we're going to go now. So establish, being established, being set and fixed. Because I'm running to a lot of people that are my age now, and they're no longer filled with the Holy Spirit. They don't longer speak another tongue. They don't longer believe the word of faith. They don't longer. I came out of that. Uh, I came out of religion. Then I went into uh, uh, believing in, in, in what Kenneth Copeland taught and what... Uh, 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 Jerry Seville taught, I, I got established, above all, faith. And now that I go back, and I know hundreds of people in California and Florida and a lot of places, and I try to have a conversation with these people, uh, they no longer believe that. They don't longer believe that. They believe the bad report, and it really blows me away. How could you have started with me when I was 21, and we were full of faith, we were hitting the streets, we were believing God for everything, and now at 60, you know, they're not living that way no more. So Isaiah 54, verse 14, establishment. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it says, Isaiah 54, 14, I'm sorry, 14, in righteousness, I shall, estab I shall be established. I shall be far from oppression, for I shall not fear. From terror, for it shall not come near me. And Isaiah 54, verse 14. In righteousness, I shall be established. And how are we established in righteousness? Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. Seek first. When you're established in righteousness, uh, nothing. It says, I shall be established, I shall be far from oppression. That oppression includes depression, obsession, possession. <laughs> when you're established, there is no depression. There is no obsession. There is no possession. That's the only way you could go out and preach the kingdom of God. Established. Established. When Jesus Christ was taken by Satan uh, to the wilderness for 40 days to be ten tempted by him, he came out established. He came out when Satan tried to uh, tempt him with food. The first words out of Jesus' mouth was the word of God. No matter what he said, the word of God, the word of Jesus Christ came out established. Jesus Christ's uh, mission statement was, was repent or have a change of mind for the kingdom of God is at hand. He was established. So when you're Isaiah 54, in righteousness I shall be established. I shall be far from oppression, obsession, depression, possession, and anything like that. <laughs> you will be far from it. For I shall not fear from terror, for it shall not come near me. We're not supposed to fear none, none of those things. Psalms 1 3. Pastor was talking, was teaching out of the book of Psalms, and, and I found out in Luke 24 that Jesus said this, and it's, not, it's for the first time I saw it, where he says, where he spoke of himself, the things written about him in the Psalms. <laughs> you know, I just, I know the whole Bible is about Jesus. But he spoke of himself about the things written about him in the Psalms. So Psalms uh, chapter 1, verse 31. Now, I don't know what version I'm reading from. I didn't check to see. You mean 3? There is no Oh, I mean 3, yeah. That's what I am reading. Psalms 1, verse 3. Thank you. I shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That brings forth its fruits in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever I do shall prosper. And that's us. We're established. We're like trees planted in river by the rivers of water. 
That's us. Whatever we do shall prosper. I teach this to my children. I teach this as to many people as I can. We, prosperity is a sign of you being established. Now, prosperity, people think being prosperous. Uh, there's different levels of prosperity or, or ways of looking at prosperity. You know, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. But whatever you, when you're established, whatever you do, you will prosper. You will prosper. So it's important. Amen. You will prosper. Proverbs 24, verse 3. At 60, I could talk about these things more. Uh, I've lived the real Proverbs 24 verse 3 I've lived uh, a tough life <laughs> you know my I get into it with my mom sometimes I don't know what they think about me sometimes and I, and I don't understand and, and I told my mom this once I said what do you think I've been doing for the last 30 years she said playing golf that's what she said well, that's probably what it appears like. <laughs> but I haven't been playing golf for the last 30 years. I have not. And, and, and I said, Mom, how many gallons of milk do you think I have bought in the last 30 years? And boxes of cereal. <laughs> you know? And, you know, I, I have helped raise seven children. Five are adults now, and I have an eight and a 12. You know, I'm still buying gallons of milk. I still, I'm the one who goes home and try one of my things is never to get home empty-handed. So I always try to go to the store and buy milk and fruit and bananas and, and you know, I, I, Bella has to eat her apple and her banana and her plum and her oranges. Do you know what an apple costs nowadays? 75 cents. <laughs> you know what three little plums cost? Little ones, two dollars, one ninety nine a pound. I know. Gallon of milk, thank God, it's only a dollar forty nine on the West Coast. It's like three something. <laughs> but uh, so I get into these conversations with my mom, my dad. Where have I mean? What do you think I do? And she said, play golf. I'm like wow. But Proverbs twenty four verse three: Through wisdom I build my house. Wisdom is what in the Bible? The principal thing in the Bible. Principal thing, wisdom is. I build my house through understanding it is established. My house is established. It's a little crazy, but it's established. It's established. You know, you don't know sometimes, you wonder about your children, and now that I go back and I play golf with my 40-year-old, and, and my other 40-year-old has a, uh, 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 a dance studio in Scottsdale, Arizona, and, and my daughter who, who, who has a passion for India, and, but she just had brain surgery out of the blue, you know, nine months ago, has a, how old is the smallest one? A year old? She has a one-year-old and, and a three-year-old, and, and she's married and went through her, whatever she went through, and and you start seeing your children when they're older, and the children you help raise. I take all the glory for it sometimes, but I always have to remember, I help raise. <laughs> you know, and you start, you start thanking God, like, wow. You know, you start like, wow. What, what you know, all those things, and, and they talk to you, and, and my 40-year-old tells me all, everything I taught him when I was a kid, you know. I pray for him and his warts are gone and I pray for him then and he believes, you know, you speak to mountains and I'm like, wow. You know, wow. And it's like a blessing. It says, through wisdom I build my house, through understanding it is established and through knowledge its rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. And we're not talking about gold and silver and big screen TVs and we're not talking about that. You know, we're talking about uh, the richness of God's Word. The things that, uh, the memories. I look at pictures and I'm like, I get overwhelmed with, with, with joy in my life. When I look at the hundreds, and Eric has taken thousands of pictures of not only us, of you guys, and you guys probably don't even know it. 
thousands. And, and I scroll and some passed away and some got married. And I'm like, it just, it's just a richness that can't explain. But it comes through wisdom and understanding. You must understand the Word of God correctly. One thing I would tell all of you is to read the Word of God like you've never heard it before. Like you never heard it before. Like you just forget everything, just read it. When God said, let us make man in our image. Who was with him? <laughs> who was with him? Who else? Mm -hmm. That's like saying, I go to a piece of land and I say, let us make a cabin on this piece of land. Who was with you? Me, myself, and I. Me, myself, and I spirit, soul, and body, you know? As a, as a 12 year old, I went to the library and I said, I wanna know who was with God. <laughs> you know, cause the, the response is Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. His creation was with him. His creation was with him. He said, let us make man in our image. It wasn't just the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's not just, me, myself, and I, when I say, I'm going to build a cabin on that land. It's my family, my wife, my children. Let us make the toy store. Was it just you, yourself, and I? No. It was all of Jackson. When God said that, his creation was behind him. So it went bad. <laughs> Amen. So read the Bible differently. Uh, Psalms 40, verse 2. Psalms 40, verse 2. Okay, you, you preached till 8.30 yesterday, last week, Pastor? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Shells, Lisa's not here to text, <laughs> text anybody today. So, Okay, Psalms 40, verse 2. God, Psalms 40, verse 2. Verse 2, yeah. Psalms 40, verse 2. You also two. brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my foot upon a rock, and established my steps. And established my steps. And, you know, I'm not talking to newbies here, because I know you are all established. You know? You know, you guys are all established. I'm just bringing to you to remembrance. That's all. And your steps... There was, uh, back in the 80s, I went to a church, and, and you've probably seen it, and it's, and it's nothing new, but when the last thing you see as you left the church was welcome to the mission field, you know. Welcome to the mission field. When that's, you know, you're walking in, it says, welcome to the mission field, you know. And uh, he's, he establishes our steps. God's goal is for us to meet new people. He puts new people on your path every day. Every day. I, I found myself at Cascades to, uh, this morning. I had to do something, and I was running around, and I, I, someone was put in my path in dire need. In dire, dire, dire need. You know, spent 20 minutes talking to the person, and thank God for the God pockets. They came through. You know, the unexpected. I had no clue. In dire need. So God brought me up out of the horrible pit. He brought me out of a horrible that day when I uh, rebelled against the church, it was horrible. It was not good. I literally went after flesh. <laughs> you know, we don't go after flesh. I went after flesh. And uh, he brings us out of no matter where we're at. But he just doesn't bring us out. He puts our feet upon a rock, which is Jesus, and establish our steps. Psalm, Proverbs 4, uh, chapter uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 26. I like your accent, brother. You want to read that again? <laughs> Proverbs 4. Uh-huh. And verse 26 and 27. Okay. Uh, Proverbs 4, verse 26. Mm-hmm. Ponder the path of your feet, 
and let all your ways be established. Continue. Do not turn to the right or left. Remove your feet from evil. Amen. Amen. So, it says, I ponder the path of my feet and let all my ways be established. And, and those are the days we're living in, I really believe. We are, uh, uh, we are living in some... I try not to, I try not to le listen to the news in America. What I do is I go to other, other countries and listen to the news from other countries in, in periodicals, in newspaper form, because they see us as a prospering country. They see us as a country that is doing good. They see us as a country they might want to move their technology business to. And I can't listen to, to us, uh, our news media, putting us down, putting us down. I, I listen to what Germany has to say about America. They ain't talking bad about us. I listen to what Spain has to say. They're not talking bad of us, about us. Mexico's not talking bad about us right now. They want the wall now. That's one thing I... I you know, when we went the first time to California, when I, we all went, took the whole family, and people would stand with signs almost in every other corner, F Trump, F Trump. And we went to Hollywood, and they had destroyed his, you know, I was supposed to say POTUS. Why didn't you say that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, they, was, they destroyed his star. It's back, it's, you know. And there's been a shift. I, don't, I didn't sense that hostility. I asked the lady at the Greyhound station, I said, why don't you help, you speak Spanish, why do you help, help these immigrants? She says, because I came in legally and I don't want them to take my job. You know? And <laughs> I'm thinking, I work for Panda Express at 60, three times a week, four times a week, and we can't hire nobody. At 60, I'm the strongest worker there. And we got 30-year-olds and 19-year-olds and 24-year-olds. I'm the strongest physically, mentally, and the quickest. You know? And I wonder sometimes, I go take a bus and bring them all to help me out at Panda, you know? And, and so it, it, a lot of stuff has turned around. It, there's a shift now where even when I went, people that, you know, that know me would say, no, 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 And now they're like, yeah, we want that wall. We don't want them coming in. They're going to take our jobs and stuff like that. But, you know... Uh, I ponder the path of my feet and let all my ways be established. And that's for, for everybody. And Christians all over the world have a right to travel wherever they want if God has spoken to you. We have people from here in Honduras. You know? Where are you from, my brother? Nigeria. Nigeria. They're here. God established your path here. God has things for them. You know, and sometimes we come to America, it's ex I tell these people, it's expensive to live to America. I mean, I don't know what your dream is. I tell them straight up, you're going to have to have a car. You're going to have to have insurance to drive that car. You're going to have to live in an apartment. It's probably going to cost you 900 a month. You know, oh, we can do all things through Christ. Who gives us strength? Oh, I shut up then. <laughs> you know, because they're quick. Todo lo puede en Cristo Jesús que me la fortaleza me dicen. That's what they tell me. Mm -hmm. Buscar primeramente el reino de Dios. Y toda That's what they tell me when I tell them that. It's expensive to live in America. They quote the word. I'm like, shoot, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know, but there's a lot of things because we live in America. I think uh, one of the things we have in America is, is these, every service should be packed, I believe. We have that freedom to, to learn God's word and, and to... Uh, to just, we're free to be established in who we are. You know, we're free to be established at our jobs. We're free to be established in our neighborhoods. We're not like in some countries where they're watching you. Other countries, they're just watching you. Even your neighbors are watching, they report you. There's another brother, you, you've mentioned this, but somebody else told me you can't stick your arm out of a car in Australia. You can't. If somebody sees you, they'll just report you. You can't stick your it's just it's just a rule. Mm -hmm. It's a law. Your car. You can't just say, Oh, I'm gonna relax and stick you can't. We're not to But anyways, uh that's my teaching. 
Uh, I want to let my brother from Nigeria say a few words just because I feel like it. Could I do that, Pastor? We got, we got, a, we got, brother, come up, say something. <laughs> That's what you get for it. I love accents. My wife, my wife will tell you that. question, can he do it in five minutes? God bless you. Love you guys. I Thank hope you. I encouraged you and I wasn't too hard, but yeah. love you guys. No, you Thank okay. you, much. There you go. Wow. Uh, well, um, thank you very much for changing the button <laughs> to me. <laughs> um, uh, from where he, you know, he stopped, um, the word establishment um, is one of the batches that we all, as Christians, have to um, you know, abide with. Because it's the only word that makes a difference from other people. Mm. Amen? It's until you establish yourself in the word of God, you will now be convinced and be able to convince other people because you are like a mirror. They're looking at you, just like he said. Some people watch you. They watch what you do. They watch where you go in the evening. They watch where you go at night. They take records of your statements. So if you are not established in the world, and if the world, that establishment also be upon the rock, like the Bible say, to make you firm. Because there are two things. You can be established, but the real establishment is your firmness. Amen? Amen. So when you are firm, then other people can look at you and be resoundingly sure that that which is in you is treasurable. They want to be like you. They want to associate with you. Nobody likes failure. Success has a lot of friends. But until you are established, like the big gates of the world, a lot of people will want to be your friend. You know, because they know one way or the other, they will find something valuable that they will tap into. But the Bible says, if there is anything good in, in you, if there is any virtue that you see in another person, you know, covet it. And that can only be seen until you are established. Most importantly, the word is also the same, uh, uh, you know, um, this, you know, is, is the same power that will lead you to being established. So every morning, like my brother said, it is imperative that we look at the world from another perspective. You know, only, until he talked about reading a word like you never read it before. Because each time we read a, a portion of the Bible, it makes different sense to us. It gives a different meaning. You know, now we have King James Version. We have new um, uh, international standard. Everyone is trying to bring their perception into the world. But until you begin to decipher, until you begin to read, to establish yourself, then you begin to see the difference. Some use contemporary languages now to drive home their words, their, their messages. Some don't like the old King James Version, thou shall, thou will, you know, they think it's quite, you know, a cake for them to understand. But then until you begin to, to read different version, you now begin to establish yourself, you know, find that this is what they are saying imperatively. This is what the meaning of this is. So I thank you very much, my brother. Um, as a missionary, like you said, until you begin to travel around the world, you begin to see creation at its best. That explains why people, sometimes they take a trip to the mountains, 
to go and look at the creation, the, you know, the beauty of God's handwork. Some leave their country, they go to other countries, and then they begin to see other people and understand how they live. There are some countries like where I come from, it is quite difficult to preach the word. You can evangelize on the streets. There are places where they hear you speak about Jesus. The next one hour or the next 50 minutes, they come and put the place ablaze, kill people because they are speaking the Bible. So America, everybody wants to come over. Nobody speaks bad about America from the international perspective. It's like a dreamland, you know, that a land that everybody wants to come and have freedom to do whatever you want to do. Just like he said, you can, you know, you have freedom to associate to any religious organization. You have freedom to preach whatever you want to preach and get people. Well, there are countries from the where I come from, you know, to have house fellowship like this we're having, you have to sneak out when people are sleeping so that they don't see you to go and have fellowship. So God bless this country for the opportunity has given a lot of us to have freedom of association, freedom of religion, freedom, you know, in every area, you know. And then um, in the 50s and 60s, um, when I first got born again, but I was, well, I'm about 52 now. I was little. And then um, we, we used to have Bibles sent to us. But you have to, you know, write an application, a request, send it, um, um, there's one Bible college, the Mundi, Mundi Institute. Institute. The Mundi Institute. Yes. So they used to print Bibles, you know, uh, New New uh, New Testament, and they would send to us. But you have to write, you know, to request for it before they send it. At the point, the missionaries will come with boxes, you know, you know, container load of Bibles and. That was how they were evangelizing, you know. And uh, it was awesome. A lot of people were moving from the traditional religion and embracing Christianity. And um, that was how it started. So America was doing go for at that time, which I concur with what you say. But now, I think the reverse is almost like the, you know, the case. So but we pray that um, the light will continue to you know to born so i thank you and i i want to thank you all too for you know listening to me and i know you will probably take one or two messages from that so god bless you all thank you very much Last days, it is obvious that we are living in the last days, Father God. Mm -hmm. So I just ask that this word be established and we be sensitive uh, to hear that word that's in us already, but to hear that soft uh, uh, voice, the way you speak to us. You speak to us individually in different ways, Father God, and that we could just uh, just be sensitive to that word and, and uh, come up with strategies, ideas. Uh, to not only go out all over the world, but to here in Jackson and in Hillsdale and in and, and Albion and in uh, and, uh, the surrounding cities, Father God, uh, to preach your word, even maybe learn new languages like uh, Indian or uh, uh, India and, and that language to reach out to all the people who are coming from India, Father God, and, and from Korea and from uh, 
the Pakistans, Father, that are coming in, that we have, that is a church that has people who are skillful in their language to reach out to them, Father God. Not only in English, Father God. So I just thank you, Lord, for this, for just being good to us. And, and I thank you and I worship you and I thank you for what you're doing in this church and that I know the vision you established in this church is not a dead one. Amen. It is written. It's been put before the people. Mm-hmm. And it will be established, Father God, in the yeah. name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Three prayer requests type things. Uh, 